Okay. And the time is for, it's till what time? So I know how to time myself. About hour. 10.30 till? Till when? How long? I think it's a hour, a hour plus, something like that. I just forgot. Is it a hour or a half? It could be a half or a half, no problem. No problem. Okay, I'm going to say that I'm going to say that I'm going to say that. We'll do it like an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Okay. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a topic that everyone's aware of, and we're going to um, sort of re-examine it. And because this week is Parshat Shlach, you can guess what topic we're picking on. We'll take out the story of the, the story of the spies. I just want to make sure my connection's good. Okay. And uh, for participation, we can use chat. If you want to talk, you can just press the, uh, you can raise your hand if you want, or you can press the talk button. But remember, my sure I like participation, but, but not, it's a little harder on Zoom. But sometimes they're going to ask you to put the, um, to use chat. I'll give you an example. What I want you to do, if you can use your chat, We'll play a little game. If someone asked you, what was the sin of the spies? And you had to give the answer in, say, five words or less, you know, in a half a sentence. What was the primary sin of the spies? Okay. We know they sinned because they were punished. But if someone asked you, what was their sin? I want you to write in the chat in English or in Hebrew if you want. Write in the chat in, in as short as possible what you say was the sin of the spies. I'll take a look at, uh, then we'll look at all the answers. <laughs> it's okay. We get uh, modern commentary also. Okay. Right, these are all the answers I wanted to hear. It's just, it's just keep on keep, keep on putting them in. As soon as I get 15 answers, I'll we'll take a look at them. But as many people as can answer is good. We we'll have a lot of fun today. Just so I know what to teach today. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, we'll take a couple more. Coming in like uh, election results. Go. Okay. Okay, I think we have okay. So let's take a look at the chat so far, okay? We'll use whatever we have. I have um they didn't trust in Hashem. Keep that in mind. Fake news, which means what? Fake news is true or not true? <laughs> That's a good question. What do you mean by fake news? Lush and horror about the land, okay. Hashem means um, I guess something they didn't believe in Hashem, no belief in God. They didn't follow instructions and upset the congregation. Okay, went beyond their limit. Remit. Didn't have a Muna. Didn't believe Hashem would help them conquer the land. Uh, they only said the best things. Okay, the bad things. Lowering the morale. Negative attitude. Learn and not to leave. Learn and not leave. Okay, that's the from one. <laughs> that was the colder one. Okay, so guess what we're going to do to all those answers? Um, there's a bit of truth in all of them. I wanted, what I want to show you now is why I disagree with all of them. The first thing we need to do is try to understand what was the logic in sending the spies, okay? Now, um, what I wanna do is, remember there's, there's the story of the spies here and the story of the spies in Tavarim. I'm only gonna use the story of the spies in Tavarim simply to support what I wanna do today. I'm not gonna deal with all the differences, but maybe at the end of the show I'll have time for that. But as far as, um, about the land, from the Bible that I read, they said the land was very good. And it never says Lashon Hara, it says Diba. We have talked about the difference between Diba and Lashon Hara. But the land they say is very good. And if you look about what they were commanded to do and what they did, if you look at the story, I'm pretty sure there's nothing they did wrong. How are we gonna check that? The first five minutes of this year, what we're gonna do is something very simple. We're gonna make a list of all the things they were commanded to do and then see what happens if they fulfill their command. Got that? Let's do that real quick, and then we'll get back to work. So I'm going to share my screen. And if you have your chumash with you, it's even better. 
And we're going to open up our Tanakh. I'll use an English Tanakh because it's easier to read from. Um, where's my English Tanakh? Here we go. Numbers, Sefer Devarim, we want chapter 13. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Control plus plus. There we go. We're going to return to Elbing Tukim very soon. We have a list of where they're from. And this is what Moshe tells them to do. Pasek Yitzayim. Remember, it didn't say the ragel means the tour. The tour is to scout out the land to see it, like a, like a pilot trip. And it says, go up from the south and up the mountain range. Okay. Take a look at the land. This is very general, and this is all going to be detailed next. Are the people in the land, are they strong? Are they weak? Are there many or few? Now, is the land itself, is it good or bad? That's probably agricultural. And the cities, what are they? Are the cities fortified or are they open? And is the land, how, how good is the fruit of the land? Is it you know, good produce? Is it like the stuff you buy in Derech Beit Lechem in Rehovaza? Or the stuff you get in the, uh, in the supermarket? Okay. What type of trees? There was, what potential for agriculture is there? And be strong and bring some samples. Right? And the days, the time of the year was early grape season, pretty much this time of the year. It works out really nice that, that, um, that we always read Parsha Shlach pretty much the beginning of the summer when grapes are just getting into season. So that's what they're commanded to do. Soon we'll talk about who's being sent and why these people are being sent. But let's just see, to begin things off, if they did what they were commanded to do. And I'm assuming they're supposed to tell the truth. Number one, by Alu. Remember, Alu is a if they go up. The Torah Tarets, they fulfill. And from all the way from the Negev, all the way to um, up north, in other words, they did what they were told to do. Okay. Um, we mentioned they go up to Hebron, and we talked about that they see the giants there. We'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, they bring some samples from Nachal Eshkol. They bring Anavim. They carry back with, uh, you know, on a, like in the picture of the, of the tourist uh, insignia. And they brought from Rimonim and Tainim, again, probably late June, early July. They played the call Nachal Eshkol, okay? Then they come back after 40 days. It's cute how we have 40 days again. 40 days is like a magic number all through, uh, ever since the flood. Now, let's see if they fulfilled their mission. We'll talk about who they're supposed to report to, but they go back to Moshe and to Aaron and to the entire congregation. If this is good or bad, we'll have to see. To meet Bar Paran, Kadesh, that's the name of the place. It's Kadesh Barnea. And they answered the entire nation, all the questions, and they showed them the samples. And the samples are good, right? By Sapulo Vayamru, what did they tell everyone? We came to land which you were sent to see. And indeed, what is it? As God said, it's Zavat Chalabudvash Vizet Periyah. That's good things about the land. There's nothing negative there at all. It indeed is a land flowing in milk and honey, which means there's potential there for good agriculture, and they bring samples of the fruit. Now, I know everyone makes a big deal about the word Ephes because the Ramban says that's their big sin. But if you look through the rest of the Tanakh, Ephes always means on the other hand. If there's one point, on the other hand, Ephes. It's like, albeit kind of idea. And at first glance, there's nothing wrong with the word Ephes. They're just saying, on the one hand, the fruit is indeed good. On the other hand, what's negative? The people there are strong. Now, is that true or false? Ephes ki azam Is it true that the people in the land are strong or not? It's true, isn't it? They're not lying. And the cities that we saw are fortified. And we saw the children of giants there. Remember, they saw that in Hebron. Everything they say here is totally true. That they were told to find out, are the people strong or weak? Say the people are strong and the cities are fortified. And then they talk about the nations there. Amalek is in the south, the Chiti on the, on the mountain range, and the Canaanites are on the, on the sea and on, on the coast on, on the, but in the Jordan Valley. Now, up until this point, there's not one thing they've done wrong. That should be crystal clear. The first one now, so far everything they're giving, that's not fake news, that's real news. And they haven't given any opinions yet, agreed? The first one to give an opinion is Kalev. 
Now, what's Kaleb do? Kaleb gets that's Anmanapia by Yahas, like saying like hush. Kaleb gets every people, I guess, a murmuring. And what's he tell the people? Moshe? Mm -hmm. He gives an opinion. And what's he say? Let's go up and conquer the land because, yes, we can. Now, what is Kaleb's opinion based on? There's two possibilities, aren't there? He could be say, our army is strong enough. I'll give an example from today. I'm not trying to take sides, just an example. Uh, there's an argument today, should we annex, you know, should we do, um, not annex, um, yeah, I guess annex, the, you know, the settlements of the West Bank. Pe some people say, yes, we should. Other people say, we shouldn't. Those who say we can't say, oh, the whole, there'll be a, an uprising, there'll be an intifada, and our army can't handle it, or you know, it's, we'll, we'll get, our army's too weak to deal with another intifada, or a possible war with Iran, and yeah. other people say, no, our army's strong enough, we're weak. It could be an argument whether how strong their army is, is the army capable of defeating them or not? Or the argument might be, understand what I'm getting at? And that other people say, It sounds like the argument of how strong the army is, like right-wingers and left-wingers. Or like nationalists and like, the same argument we have today, how strong is the army? That's one way to view the argument, which is legitimate. And it's a legitimate argument because no one knows for sure how strong the army is. Has this army ever fought before or not? We fought Amalek and that was it. And it wasn't so simple to battle with Amalek. And I think Amalek was only one nation and we needed uh, God's help to get it done. But Amalek is only one of the nations we have to face coming in. And it could be what the people are saying is, is totally fine. I don't see a sin yet. They're giving an opinion. The first one to give their opinion was Kalev. And now um, the other people give their opinion. And if you send people, especially if they're Jewish, to check something out, don't be surprised to give an opinion. The next thing they do, now, the other thing they may be arguing about is whether God can help them. You follow? It could be, is, are they arguing over the facts about how strong the army is? Are they agreeing the army is stronger, but the question is, can God help them or not? That's what some of you were, were um, alluding to in, the, uh, in your answers. Now, what did leaders do? But you see Dibata Aretz. Diba usually means, it's called slander as opposed to, Diba is not necessarily a false. Diba is when you spin information. When I'm in a, a let's say, um, a Diba is like what the newscasters do sometimes. If I want to be a good example, meaning you're giving news, but the way you present the news, right, the way you give the information, you, you're presenting the news, not to give information, but to shape opinion. I can bring a thousand examples from newscasters you know, be it CNN, be it Fox, be it Arut Stein, be it um, you know, Arut Sheva, depending on what thing. I can give the news, but the way I present the news, the inflection of my voice can help shape people's opinion. Now, um, so they take the, and what do they say? Okay? The land that we pass by is what? It's an Erzo Chedek Yoshveha. I'm clear exactly what that means, but it seems like it's saying anyone who goes there, just the people get devoured up. And everyone, but it sounds like you get something military that there's no way any, any foreign power can come and, and conquer them. Because all the people we saw there, they're all giants. And we also saw the Nephilim there, wherever they are, but also they seem like they're, they're Nephilim, the children of giants. Um, and in our eyes, we were like grasshoppers. They were like, you know, they were like giants. We were like grasshoppers. Uh, there's no doubt that they're trying to support their opinion that militarily, there's no way we can do it. Now, the story, the chapter ends here, but the story doesn't end here. How did people react to this in Pasek and Perikidalet? Here's the key point. The people now reach what opinion? They're assuming that if we follow God's command to conquer the land, we're all going to die. Got that? And what are they saying? And this is going to repeat itself numerous times in Chumash. They complain to Moshe and Aaron, and they say, what? It would have been better off had we died in Egypt or here in the desert. What's their conclusion? Their conclusion is, this is another death trap. But this is what I'm trying to explain to you. I want to show you this. Chumash, it's been going on for the last year. 
God's been doing miracles left and right. The people's opinion, every time they're in trouble, is as follows. God wants us all dead. And every time he's coming up with new ways of killing us. The people have an attitude problem, and all they see is that they're on a death march. And let me explain you why. In other words, they think that if they listen to Moshe and to Aaron, and hence listen to God, and try to conquer the land, they're all going to die. And therefore, since they're going to die anyhow, it's better to go back to Egypt and not take the risk. Because they're saying going to Israel is suicidal. Before I go any farther, um, I want to just take a quick look at the exact same story in Sefer Dvarim. In chapter 1 in Dvarim, listen to what the people say. Again, I'm just taking the version there, which is very similar. But I want to see what the people said. He says, V'lo vitem lalot, and you went against God. Listen carefully. Pasach Zain in chapter 1 in Dvarim. V'teradu bo halechem v'tomaru. Listen carefully. V'sinat Hashem otanu hotzianu me'aretz Mitzrayim, letet otanu b'yad amori l'ashmideinu. You see that? They believe in God. Boy, do they believe in God. You follow? They believe he exists, but they hate him. You follow? What do they see here? Listen carefully what they're saying. Why is God commanding us to conquer the land? Because he hates us. And it's that hatred, that's why he took us out of Egypt, to get us killed by the Amorites. And then where are we going? Our brethren, that's our leaders. They scared us. That's the diva they brought down. Telling us, oh, there's all these great Amr Gadabram Bani Anakim and Bani Anakim. We're scared stiff. Okay. And I told you, Moshe says, don't be afraid of them. The God will help you conquer them and all the things you've seen. And then he says, listen carefully. Most of you translate this, you don't believe in God. That's not true. They believe in God, they, they believe in his existence. But the question is, the word Mamina is going to say, and I think they believe that he maybe even can help them. I'll prove that in a minute. But they don't support God. What I want to show you now is everyone believes that God exists. And they know he can do miracles. The question is, how do they view God? What is God up to? And what they see is the God who wants them all dead. Now I'm going to take another five-minute break now. And I want to show you story by story since we left Egypt how the people have an attitude problem that just doesn't go away. Let me give you a little example from a, uh, from a five-year-old. I think I maybe used this before. A little five-year-old child uh, just had supper and had a, a little chocolate for dessert. And the child, the five-year-old, wants another piece of chocolate for dessert. And mommy says, no. He says, I want chocolate. And mommy says, no. Again. And then what's the baby say? Mommy, you hate me. I don't know if you've ever seen something like that before. Now, why does the five-year-old think mommy hates me? Because daddy gives me chocolate, daddy loves me. Saba gives me chocolate, Saba loves me. Mommy doesn't give me chocolate, that means mommy hates me. You follow? No. Really, mommy loves the five-year-old more than Saba and Saba do. You understand why? And because, out of love, because he, she cares about how the baby's growing up and his health, it doesn't give him chocolate. But the five-year-old doesn't understand that, doesn't appreciate that, because it's a five-year-old. It's a question of education. Now, if you understand my analogy, let me show you now. The people going out of Egypt, when we left Egypt, all we wanted was a lighter workload. We didn't want to become God's people. We weren't begging God, we want to be your people. We were complaining about a bad workload. We're going to go now. Let me open up another, um, going to open up another hummus for you. Um, I want to go back to Sefer Shemot for a second. I'm sorry, I meant to go to Sefer Shemot. Um, and open up chapter 14, Perak Yudal and Sefer Shmot. After we leave Egypt, we just saw the miracle of the 10 plagues, Makat Bechor, the whole thing, and then Paro comes and chases us. Remember the story? Paro gets closer, and Bnei lift up their eyes and see Paro's on one side. They're all scared. Listen carefully to verse 11, Pasuk Yudal. V'yamru ha-Moshe, ha-mibliyin k'varim b'mitzayim l'kachtanu l'mut na-midbar, Listen to this attitude of the people. Moshe, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? You brought us down here to die in the desert? And, th and they say, hey, we told you back in Egypt this is crazy. You know, leave us alone. It's better we work in Egypt. Let's be slaves to Pharaoh. We don't want to die. 
Moshe says, don't worry, and God does the miracle. But you see their attitude? We see from here, they think God wants them all dead. First he kills the Egyptians, now he kills us. If that wasn't enough, so we had Kriyat Yamsuf, the believers, for a couple of days. Within a month's time, in chapter 16, it's a month later, it's the 15th day now of the second month, there's no food, okay? What do they say? Pasa Gimel. V'amru alehem b'nei Yisrael. Listen carefully. This is a month later when they're running out of food. What are they saying? It would have been better had we died in Egypt, at least on a full stomach, as slaves, but at least they went to eat. That's better than being taken out here to die out of hunger in the desert. You see their attitude? Again, they think they're on the death march, and God just wants them dead. God brings the mana. That works for a cup, maybe for a week. What happens a couple of days later, maybe a week or two later, they go to Rafidim, a new place, from Ibarsim where the man fell. They go to Rafidim, and there's no water. And the people complain again. Listen to Pasuk Gimel. The people are thirsty for water. They complain to Moshe, and listen to their complaint. They don't say we're thirsty. Again, Lamit Otivet Kovanaivet Mitabet Sama. What did they say? Why'd you bring us out here to die? Are you following the logic of what I'm trying to show you? Every event on the way, what's their attitude? God wants us dead. So God gives them water from, from the rock. And they're believers for another you know, couple of weeks. We get to Torah Harsina. Moshe goes up, Chet Egel. What happens with Chet Egel in a nutshell? Moshe leaves Aaron and Hor in charge. Aaron tells him, they go to Aaron. Aaron says, make this ego, make this celebration. They listen to Aaron. Moshe comes down, starts killing people left and right. 3,000 people get killed. What did we do wrong? We listened to our leader. We listened to Aaron. What do you want from us? It's all set up. Yeah. The best example of this, we can go right now to, um, to, to, Parsha, to last week's Parsha. If I go back now to, to Sefer Bamid, to Sefer, um, to Sefer Bamidbar, Perik Yudala, we read this last week. The people complain about the food. And this is worse, they're not, they have what to eat. Remember? They have a taiva for a taiva. And then now they want meat, they don't want money anymore. And they remember how good the food was back in Egypt. I'm sure you remember the story. Moshe is not happy. And, and, um, and Moshe says, how can I give them food? And then God tells Moshe, don't worry. We'll, go, we'll skip the leadership story here in a minute. We'll go back to it. God tells Moshe, Yad Hashem Tiksar, you see, I can give him food. Okay. And he, um, first he kicks the 70 elders, and this is what happens. Um, Moshe gathers the nation together to the desert. Got it? Pasek Lamed Aleph and Perek Yud Aleph. Burak Nasam Eit Hashem, Bayaka Slavim Min Hayam. A big wind comes and brings quail from the sea. And it lands on the camp, all the days, like tons and tons of, 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 of uh, birds, a quail, land on the camp. And two amas high, got it? Lamed bet. The people asked for food, and God gave them food, right? They started, slob, they became slobs eating the slob. They overate, and they, they took too much. They're having so much food in me. What happens? God gets angry with the people for, for taking too much. And they play the, call the place In my opinion, this, is a, this story is critical to understand the Maraglim. It's a story that happened only a week or two earlier. This is, remember, this is happening sometimes, sometime between the 20th of the year when we left our Sinai. And um, and and um, and Rosh Chodesh Tammuz when we send them Raglim, it's all within a couple of weeks. In other words, we're sending the spies soon after this event. From the people's point of view, what's it look like? We ask for food. What did God do? He sends quail so that the people eat the quail are going to die. Doesn't look like a trap. I hope you get my point. What are the people seeing? They just keep on getting killed left and right. First, God kills the Egyptians little by little. Then he kills us little by little. And we don't just die. He's always setting us up for death. 
he's giving us something to, he's giving us, you know, he says, you, know, you want food? Oh, here's the thing. You want land? Go attack the land. And what they're saying is, who's going to do the dirty work for God? The Emirates. He's commanding us to conquer Israel so that they'll come and kill us. He wants us dead. You understand this lack of trust? I'll, I'll give a terrible example, but that's pretty much what the Havdu Elif Havdalot. But if you know the story, like in, in, um, in Germany, how do you get the Jews? You get, ha, tell them you're going on a, you're going to, you know, for, for a, you're going to have a job working, and then they take them out to the, to the forest where they think they're working, and they go and kill them all. The Havdu, I'm just bringing an example of how people can lack trust when they just see death and death and death, they don't believe it anymore. They think that they're being set up. Now, I, I use the analogy of a five-year-old because you, the way to solve the problem is through education. And that's the difference between what I call hadracha. I can have every miracle, I can do any miracle possible without proper education. The miracle gets wasted. Moshe has been doing miracles since plague number one, since before we left Egypt. Miracle after miracle, the whole existence from the time we leave Egypt, from before we leave Egypt, until we get to Kadesh Barnea, miracle after miracle. But how do the people view it? They view this as that God hates them. You follow? How am I going to change that attitude problem? And now I want to go back to the beginning of Parshat Shlach. What, what I want to suggest is, and we'll see this happening, and this hap- we, sit, we saw it happening here where Moshe says, I don't want to lead them anymore. Remember, God's, Moshe says, I can't do this myself. And Moshe says, if that's what you do to me, I'd rather kill me instead of leading these people. And God's answer is, okay, gather for me 70 elders, people that you know are the elders of the nation and their officers, and bring them with you. In other words, Moshe doesn't pick the 70 elders. Moshe is told, gather 70 elders who are already elders. Got my point? God doesn't tell Moshe, I want you to choose 70 people to help you. He says, I want you to take existing leadership and bring them together. I'm going to take your leadership, remember? I'm going to come down and take from the ruach that's on you and give it to them. And they'll carry with the burden of leading the people. God's already seen that Moshe, what I'm trying to explain to you is that as a teacher, Moshe is the greatest. As a leader, as a hadracha, it's not working. He can be the greatest person ever, the greatest teacher. He's there's no compatibility between Moshe and the people. And therefore, we need different type of leadership to get the people inspired. Every parent has the same problem with the abnormal kids. How do you get your children to be inspired? They don't listen to the parents. You give them the best schooling, send them to good camp with good hadrachah, maybe, maybe a good counselor will do it. Send them to B'nai Kiva, send them to Ariel, whatever it is. Send them to Camp Moshe But With a lot of kids, regular frontal education doesn't work. But hadracha, informed education, does work. And what God's trying to do now, he's hoping that the leadership will now spring from the bottom up. And let me show you what I mean. Look now how Parshat, how parshat Shlach begins. Look in Perikud Gimel. What does God say? Shlach lecha anashim. Now, um, the word anashim doesn't mean males as opposed to females. Anashim means men. Like he's a man as opposed to he's a wimp. God's kind of saying, I want you to pick leaders, big shots, to cut time. Which people? Multi-minute. One leader, Ishachad, Ishachad, that's not one person or one male, one leader. Right? Like Boaz is an Ish, Gibor Chayah. Kol Nesibahem, which are princes of each, of each tribe. Meaning, again, Moshe is not picking the spies, is he? What's he doing? He's taking pre-appointed lead. He's taking the natural leadership that exists already. I, I want to make sure I understand my, my key point about Hadrachah here. I'll stop this share for a minute and see if anyone's following me here. Um, okay, I see if you're smiling on your faces. But I'm trying to make, get a key point across as far as, as far as leadership goes. Most God is hoping, it's clear that Moshe's leadership is not working because God's goal is not to bring Jewish people into the land of Israel. God's goal is that there'll be a nation that's going to serve God in Israel, that's eager about serving God in Israel. I want a nation with the right attitude who's eager about keeping the Torah and representing God as a nation. With Moses' leadership, it's just not working because all the miracles Moshe does, the people have the same attitude problem. We saw that, and the biggest example, Moshe himself realizes it with the mitavim. When they don't like the manu, we just want meat. 
When they're complaining about the food, there's something wrong. It's not that they have nothing to eat. They have what to eat. They don't like what the food is. There's an attitude problem that's not working. Kanat's hope is, is that maybe the existing leadership can inspire the people. So now what I want to do, I'll give you a really bad example from the news like today. Um, how do you get people to follow, to, to, to appreciate government? No one likes the president. They hate him. Again, maybe the governors can get the people to listen. Got my point? The governors are elected by each state. If I want to take the example in America, it's, let, let's, get, let's get the governors to try to convince the people to follow policy or to follow regulations. Because when the president opens his mouth, no one listens to him. They think he's bad. Again, I'm only using a comparison. Not, I'm not saying, I'm just using the analogy to make my point. There's a difference between leadership appointed by God, taking him out of Egypt, like a forced leadership, as opposed to natural leadership that grew from the grassroots. And God is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, don't you pick 12 leaders, take existing leaders, Nasir, people who are already in the same, people, the princes of every tribe, take the top leader of every tribe and send existing leadership. And what's the hope? Maybe they'll be inspired. And if those leaders are inspired, then maybe they'll inspire the people. I'm going to say that again just to make sure it's clear. What, what I want to claim is, is the logic in sending the spies is to get the people involved. If you're going to be a nation serving God, it can't be Moshe doing everything. It's like a child growing up. At the first stage, mommy does everything. But as a child gets older, he starts making his own decisions and becomes more dependent. We need the people to want to be God's people. And Moshe's leadership just isn't working. We see that story after story. And what we're hoping for now is maybe the natural existing leadership, maybe they can make a difference. And now Moshe is getting them involved. And God's telling Moshe, get the people involved. We saw it with the gathering of the 70 elders, people you know are already elders, and now the tribal princes. Maybe they'll, there you go, um, maybe they'll get the job done. Inspire them. How do you inspire them? Get them involved. Have them take a tour. Have, get, send them on a pilot trip to Israel. They'll come back with a report. And maybe they'll inspire the people to want to, to want to conquer the land. So that's point number one, why we're sending spies. And why God thinks it's a good idea. And if I follow the two stories in Devarim, remember, in Devarim it's the people's idea that God agrees to. So that's why it's easy to put the two stories together, even better when the people are suggesting it on their own. Now, what conclusion was God hoping for? And this is going to be the most important point of this year. What I want to claim is, is that, is that we want the, God wants the spies to come back and tell the people the truth that it's impossible to conquer. I'll prove that to you in a minute. They're not supposed to come back and say, piece of cake, we, our army's stronger than their army, we can do it. They're supposed to say the land is good, but it's impossible to conquer without God's help. But with God's help, it's possible to conquer. But here's the most important point. God's help is contingent on our keeping the mitzvot. Let me, let me make that crystal clear. I'm going to prove it to you now from Sefer Dvarim in a minute. What was supposed to happen, again, God's goal is for the Jewish people to keep his mitzvot in the land, to be a nation representing God. The goal is not just to believe that God exists or believe that God's powerful. The goal is a nation that's inspired and eager to represent God as a nation, to keep the Torah and keep his mitzvot. How do you inspire people to keep mitzvot? First, I can convince them it's worth it, but, but here it goes like this. If the land was lousy, there's nothing to fight for. If the land is good, that land is, oh wow, I could really be a nation there. That land is good, and the cities are good, and the produce is good, but the danger of taking it is the enemy is formidable, but I want the land anyhow then I'll take the risk of trying to conquer the land on the condition that I think there's a decent chance that we can conquer the land. But if I realize that conquering the land is impossible without God's help, and I know God can help me, but God's help is contingent on my keeping the mitzvot, what's that mean? To get that land, I need to keep the mitzvot. That might not be worth it for some people, you follow? I don't mind getting land on a silver platter. But if, if getting, if getting uh, put it this way, um, I want to go to um, Harvard Medical School, okay? That's great. But if going to Harvard Medical School means I have to be up, you know, 10 hours a night doing homework and spending the next 10 years studying and having no life, 
Who needs it? What I'm trying to explain is that there's, you can believe in God and believe he's powerful, but the question is, do you want to work for God? Do you want to dedicate your life to God? And when you realize that conquering the land, it's contingent on your keeping the mitzvot, then it's only going to work if the people want to keep the mitzvot. And I want to show you all this in Sefer Devarim, and I'm going to bring the first proof from Moshe Rabbeinu himself. Because all the people told me that the report is too exaggerated. That they're saying, you know, they're, they're making things that it's fake news. I'm going to prove to you that can't be. I'll go back to my screen. I want you to open up Sefer Dvarim, Paraket. It's 40 years later. We're in Sefer Dvarim, 40 years later. Moshe is giving his last speech before they're about to go to Israel. And this is what Moshe Rabbeinu himself says to get the people ready to go in. I call this deja vu. We're right where we were 40 years, or 38 years earlier. Moshe says as follows in Perak Tet. Shema Yisrael, ato ver hayom et yarden, you're about to cross the Jordan River. Lavo de reshet goyim, dolim batsumi mecca, arim dolot ubtzorot bashamayim. Sound familiar? Moshe is going to say word for word the same thing the Maraglim said 30 years back. You're about to cross, enter the land of Israel to conquer a land, nations greater than you, and cities fortified up to the heavens. Got it? That's no less an exaggeration than the Maraglim said. Am Gadol Varam Akim, great mighty nations, children of giants, Asher Tayadata Vatashamata Mi Hanak. You're about to conquer a nation way greater than you, way stronger than you, that everyone knows it's impossible to fight against them. Got my point? Moshe wants the people to know it's impossible to conquer the land without God's help. And therefore, he wants the Maraglim to come back and tell you the truth, like they said. Their report is 100% correct. It's impossible to conquer the land without God's help. But what do they need to know? You need to know that what? That with God's help, it is possible. And then Moshe is going to prove in his speech, look what we did to Sichon and Og. But if I look at the speech, I'll go through just a couple of examples. Go back to the introduction in Perak in 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 David. Listen carefully. What's Moshe saying? V'atay Yisrael, Shema l'chukim al mishpatim, asher nochim al amedetchem, l'asot v'ahem, Listen to these laws I'm teaching you in Sefer Dvarim. Because if you keep them, then you'll stay alive and you'll conquer the land, which I'm giving you. If you don't keep the mitzvot, it's not going to work. He'll say it again here. Look in, in, um, in Parakeh. I can bring 20 examples. I'll just bring two or three. When he begins his speech in Parakeh, Moshe says, listen to Israel, all the chukim shpatim that I'm teaching you today. And he gives, talks about the Ten Commandments. At the end, of, then he tells the story how you got scared and I became the middleman. Then God tells Moshe, you stay here and I'm going to teach you the mitzvah who came that you have to teach them. This is what Moshe says at the end. Ushmartem lasot, keep these laws that God's commanding you. Don't go left and right. The whole way which I'm commanding you, go, why? If you want to stay alive on this land and be good in the land, you better keep these mitzvot. And the next line in chapter six, he continues. He says, what's coming up now in the speech is the chukim ishpatim I'm commanding you to keep in the land. You're going now to inherit. Right? In order that you fear God to keep all of his laws that I'm commanding you today. And listen carefully. V'shamati Yisrael v'shamati lasot asher yitavlach v'asher tubun mo'on. Okay? Make sure to leave these laws so it's got to be good for you. And you'll multiply. Like God promised your forefathers, a land flowing in milk and honey. Then he goes in Shema, what's he say? Um, yeah, keep all these laws. And then, you know, Shmor Tishmor Mitzvat Hashem Elokecha, Pasek Yudchet, Vasita HaTov Yashar Bene Hashem, why? Lemani Tavlach, Ubata Vyarashtet Arta Tova, Hashem Nishma Hashem Lavotechem, Lavotecha. If you want to conquer this land, Ladof and Koyu Vecha Bifanecha, you better keep God's mitzvot. In other words, the knowledge that the land is good, will motivate the people to want to conquer the land. The knowledge that conquering the land is impossible without God's help is critical to motivate the people to keep the mitzvot. I want the people to want the land and want to keep the mitzvot. 
And therefore, the knowledge that conquering the land is impossible without God's help will keep you on your toes, keep the land. It's like nowadays, if you know that following a medical, uh, wearing a mask, let's say, if you know that's going to save your life, you'll wear a mask. You follow? If you don't believe it will save your life, you won't wear a mask. I'm, I'm going to follow a set of laws if I really believe and really want it to work. I'll bring another, just two, three more examples from, I'll go right to what you know from Shema. What, what do we say in Shema every day? You know, Shema Mitzvotai, keep my laws, I'll give you rain at the right time. Be careful, Yishamor Lechem. If you go astray, what will happen? God will get angry at you if you don't keep his laws, and I'll throw you out of the land that you're getting. You keep the laws. And then at the end of the parak, remember, Laman Yubu Yimechem? This is key. If you keep all these laws, I'm commanding you to love God, to fear God, to go in His ways, then on what condition, on what condition are you going to get the land? God will help you conquer the land if what? If you, if you do what? If you're willing to keep His mitzvot. Then everywhere you go, I'll be with you. And no one will be in your way. Hope that's crystal clear now. In other words, what I want to claim is, what was God's goal in sending the Meraglim? I, I hope I proved that clearly. Again, just two more lines in. God's saying in Re'eh, I'm giving you a blessing or a curse. The blessing if you keep the mitzvot. And the Klala if you don't keep the mitzvot. Moshe, 40 years later, is saying the same thing he was saying 30 years beforehand. God wants you to conquer the land. God will help you conquer the land. He can't help you. It's impossible without God's help. And therefore, you need God's help. You don't just have to believe that God exists. You have to understand that God can help you, but his help is contingent on your keeping the mitzvot. And God's goal is for you to keep the mitzvot. And therefore, what do I gain by sending spies? Number one, I want the existing leadership to inspire the people. But I want the leadership to understand that with God, without God's help, it's impossible to get the land. And therefore, I want the leadership to inspire the people, hey, we can do this, but we all have to wear masks. I'm sorry, we can do this, but we have to keep God's mitzvot. You know, we can get through this. We can conquer the land, and we can defeat these enemies if we follow God's rules. Therefore, if the people don't want to follow God's rules, where do they realize? Then we're going to die. And if they're not interested in being God's people and keeping his laws, you know what? Who needs the headache? Let's go back to Egypt. We don't have to follow rules there. We just have to be slaves, and that's it. They'd rather be slaves to Pharaoh than be slaves to God. And therefore, the punishment is a consequence and not even a punishment. What the people's attitude to the report of the spies indicates that they're not ready yet to be God's people. We'll talk about Moshe's filah in a minute. But what I'm trying to show you is that, well, God was sort of taking a chance, but there, there weren't too many other possibilities. Had we just gone into Israel straight in, we wouldn't have made it because we're not ready to keep his mitzvot yet. Because we saw from the story of the, of the mitavim, the people aren't there yet. Remember, remember like, the people are not interested in keeping the mitzvot. They're interested in getting out of the desert and living a good life. They don't mind getting all the privileges of the land of Israel. They don't want to take the responsibilities. And Moshe is telling them, without taking those responsibilities, there's no way God's going to help you conquer the land. The hope is going to be that the local leadership, the existing leadership, if I can inspire them to inspire the people. Now, there could be one of two reasons why the, why the existing leadership doesn't do that. And again, they believe that God exists. They don't know that God exists. They know they took him out of Egypt. They saw the miracles. But the question is, do they have no trust in the people themselves? It means, oh, I know, I know my, I know my congregants. So not, I'll give you a really bad example from nowadays. You have all these rabbis. Like and if you have friends in America, you know the story. Do we open the shoals or not? Remember, it's dangerous. But we could open the shoals, you know, with, under these regulations. But many rabbis don't open their shoals. Why? Because they know the congregants aren't going to follow the regulations. They know there's five people in shul who aren't going to listen. These people, these people won't keep two meters apart. These people won't wear their masks. These people are going to come to shul even though they're sick and coughing anyhow because they think it's okay. And you're so sure that your people are not going to follow the rules, I said, forget I'm not going to open up shul altogether. Hope you got my analogy. I think it fits there perfectly. Meaning, the leadership, the leadership has no faith in the people that they're going to keep the laws. And therefore, the most logical thing to do as responsible leaders of each tribe is, you know what? It's not worth it. Let's go back to Egypt. They don't want to take the challenge of becoming God's people. 
Now, um, if I go back to the story, go back now to um, here. Um, if I go back here, you were here in, in Sefer Devarim, we go back to Perak Aleph. I just brought example after example in Sefer Devarim that God wants you to keep the mitzvot in order to be able to uh, conquer the land. If I see the sin of the people here, why is God so angry? Remember, we've read this. They, you know, they've gotten your tents and you said, God hates us. We're all going to die. Where are we going? And um, what's Moshe say? That attitude showed a lack of support of God. What I want to claim is emunah. We have this by Moshe Rabbeinu later on. When God tells Moshe and Aaron, you didn't support me in public. Leadership has to um, inspire and, and um, sort of project their support of God. They have to, yes, we can. They have to give the people the faith that it can happen and they can work. Not that God exists. And not only that he can do miracles, teach them and, make, and internalize by them the understanding that God's power to help you exists, but it's contingent on how you keep the mitzvot. And what it's doing, the guy who's been watching you through the desert, bringing you here with fire, etc. Yes. I, and again, in the desert, you saw all the things that I did for you, and you don't get the message. It's, you know that I can help you. You're not internalizing the message I gave you. And therefore, your attitude is showing God you're not ready yet to be his people. And therefore, God says, these people can't come into the, they can't come into the land. Okay. Then, um, Remember, how does Moshe Davin? Well, now we see Moshe's davening in. Um, now, I'm sorry, in light of this, we'll understand the Mapilim. Um, okay, uh, what did they say? God told them, don't go out. And now the right wingers, they say, no, we do want the land. Now they're taking what appeared to be Kalev's suggestion. Nope. Yes, we can do it. We'll say, we'll say, um, we'll see in a minute. And Moshe tells him, don't go up. Why? Because God's not with you. Because you're going to die to your enemies. You're not ready. I spoke to you, you didn't listen. You rebelled against God. You went up anyhow. And what happened? What God said, what happened? The Emirates come and they wiped you out. Now, what does that prove to the people? In other words, the people don't mind getting God's help, they don't want to keep his mitzvot. And the fact they don't listen to Moshe, Moshe is telling them, you want to go, you're not ready yet. The fact that, oh, you want to go, now we want the land. Sometimes you're not ready, you're not prepared yet, educationally and religiously to take the land, you need more time. The people don't buy, they want to go right away, and of course they're going to die. Now, um, if I go back now, let's go back now to Parshat Shlach and see how this explains uh, what Kalev said. So Kalev said, but Kalev said could be understood in two ways. He says, yes, we can because God can help us and we can keep his mitzvot. Or yes, we can because our army is strong. It's unclear now. But if you look in, in you look now what happens in, in chapter 14 now, the people complain to Moshe and Aaron, they say, what do you got? Remember, we're going to die. Why'd you bring us here? The people say, you know what? Let's go back to Egypt, get new leadership. What did Moshe and Aaron do? It happens over and over again in Sefer, Dvar, in Sefer Bamidbar. They don't know what to do. You understand the leadership problem? It's going to be a theme through Bamidbar. Moshe and Aaron's leadership just doesn't work. They don't inspire the people, oh, yes, we can, etc. They've given up. Moshe gave up already in chapter 11, didn't he? I can't do this myself. Moshe and Aaron simply fall on their face. They'll do it again several times in Sefer Bamidbar. That's why they're not going to be the leaders to bring them in. Who takes leadership? Yoshua bin Nun. And Kalev, now what do they do? They get their attention. You know, they rip their clothes. And what do they tell the people? The land that we're going to indeed is good, that no one disagrees with. But what's the key? Im chafetz banu Hashem. If God really wants us, I understand that if He wants us, in other words, and we want Him, and He brought us here and will give us the land, but don't rebel against God. Because if you keep His mitzvot, He'll help you. And therefore, don't be afraid of the people in the land because we can defeat them. If Hashem is with us, Hashem the people say, these guys are dangerous. These guys are crazy fanatics. We're all going to die. And therefore, the people say, let's storm these guys because they're going to lead to a national disaster. 
and God comes and saves them. Now, listen to what God tells Moshe. This means like to annoy. God is simply annoyed. Look at all the miracles I've done for them and they just don't get it. What's that mean? It can't mean they don't believe in me because they believe in God. They hate him. Remember, they believe in God because God hates us. But they don't support God. They don't want to be his people. God did all these signs. He did all these miracles and they're not able to turn those miracles into an educational message. And then God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, let me wipe them out. I'll make you a great nation. And Moshe says, what do you call it? Oh, this will be a chilo Hashem. And all the people in the land are going to say, what do you call it? They're going to say, um, um, what do you call it? God wasn't strong enough. The, the, the nations will say the same thing that the people were saying. Um, what will happen? You'll kill the whole nation in the desert. And what will the nation say? That God's not strong enough to bring us there. And therefore, he killed us in the desert. And therefore, use your midot rachamim. And remember what God says? Moshe says, forgive them for their sin. And God says, salak tikidvaracha. Now, this is very different than after Chet Ega. Why? What God agrees to do is not to kill them. But he doesn't forgive them and say, okay, you can go into the land. God doesn't change his decision. Okay, you can go into the land anyhow. He can't change that decision because they're not ready. But they've sinned, haven't they? They've shown God they're not ready to be his people yet. Now they need some more time in yeshiva. They need more time in the desert to learn, to prepare. But they're not ready to go in yet. So Moshe tells God, if you kill them in the desert, it will be a Hashem. But God tells Moshe, I can't bring them into the land. And therefore, what's the conclusion? Salah Kidvaracha means, I'll forgive them like you said. Vulam Chayani. But on the other hand, these people can't come and see. They can't get the land, right? These people, it's not only one event. It's not, this is the consequence of the whole last year. All these people who saw my glory and all my signs in the desert, and they tested me these 10 times, they still don't listen to me. These people won't see the land. Only Kalev and Yeshua will you know, survive the desert experience. And now get, get out of there. So the, the Magdalene themselves get punished with the Magifah, but the people now, and what's the result? God can't kill them because it'll be a Chil Hashem. He can't bring them to land because they're not ready. Therefore, what's the result? Wait for a new generation to grow up. I got my point? So what I'm trying to explain is, in the story of the spies, it's not because they said bad things about the land of Israel. You know, they, everyone agrees the land of Israel is good, and everyone believes that God exists, and everyone knows he can do miracles. The people are not willing and eager to keep his laws. And they'd rather be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt than be servants to God and keep his beats full. With that attitude problem, they're not ready to go in the land. And therefore, God tells them, um, therefore, God tells them, um, okay, I won't kill them in the desert, like you said, but I can't bring them in the land, therefore, let's wait for a new generation. Now, I want to end with the shir with an amazing rush bomb, which like, puts sort of icing on the cake here. Later in Sefer Dvarim, let me give you a, um, uh, let me, if, you, if anyone wants, let me turn off my screen here for a minute. I'm going to uh, open up a different thing. I want you to open up your Chumashim. Go back to Paraket, where we opened, where we started from, in Sefer Tvarim. I'm going to open up the source here and give you a, an amazing Rashbam. But if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or say something now. But, but I stop here for a minute. You can use your mic. Anyone have any questions about what we did so far? I hope my point is clear. I know it's a different way of reading the story, but I think I've, I'm, 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 I'm trying to tie the story to the overall theme of Chumash. God's goal is a nation keeping his laws in the land, making God's name sanctified by keeping his laws. The goal is not just to have Jews living in the land. Have we learned it appears to be a nation. Have we learned, anything from, have we learned anything from that? Or are we the still uh, the same? Easy, that's ask your soul, Rabbi. <laughs> are, are we the still the same people? But, but that's what Chumash is about. We, we're supposed to learn from our mistakes. I'll give you, here, I'll do this. I'll just share my screen one, one chapter. Wait a second, not yet. Let me, let me get my screen up. If you want, before we go farther, if you want to see, have we learned anything yet? Open up Tilim. I think we did the share before Pesach, maybe. Tilim Ein Chet. Ayn, I'm sorry. Tilim um, Ein Chet. Psalm 78. It's a long one, but just the first eight lines. In fact, line seven and eight is all you need to prove my point. Let me just share my, let me get my screen up and get the file I want. We want um, sources. Navi. We want. HTF. 
we want to hit limit 78 that one there we go um so let's go and edit there i'll share with you one file real quick um i'm sorry i didn't share my i didn't share my screen i'm sorry if you look i have this formatted nicely if you remember tdm 78 i'll make it nice and big move it over a little bit there we go remember this parak remember listen to my torah it tells them you know and why we have to tell this you know, we have to every generation has to tell their children what they learned from their parents. All the, um, if we can't hide from our children, every generation has to tell the next generation all the amazing things that God did for us and the laws he taught us that we have to teach our children. Pasik Vav, Laman Yidu Dora Haron Banimi Valedu, Yakubo Vistapur Liv Dehem. It was every generation has to teach the next generation the stories of the Torah, the laws and the stories, and tell that to the children. In order that we put our faith in God, by Simu Belim Kislam, Second, let me get my. Um, where's my? Oh, it's okay. Um, they put their faith in God. Don't forget the ways of God. And here's the most important point. Okay. We have to take the stories in Chumash to learn not to be like our parents' generation. That was a generation that was rebellious. The generation coming out of Egypt was a Dor Sorel More. A generation that's heart was not ready and they weren't steadfast supporting God. And Munah here doesn't believe that God exists and doesn't mean believing that God is powerful. It means being supportive of God, wanting to serve Him. And Munah is not something intellectual, it's, it's something more, um, it's more um, transformative. And Munah means not understanding that God exists or that He's how great He is. It's knowing that he can help you, but his hashkacha over you is a function of your deeds. Being supportive of God, wanting to work for him, being eager to keep the mitzvot, looking forward and wanting to be Jewish people, taking the challenge of serving God by setting up his model of society. That's what God's looking for. And if Amisa isn't ready for that, there's no point in conquering the land. Now, God might give a head start with hope you do things better. That's already... That's different, that's Midat Torah that comes up later on in Chumash. But what we're supposed to learn according to Tehillim from Chumash is not to repeat the same mistakes of the earlier generations and be ready to serve God. Not just to believe, oh, the land is good, not to praise the land and talk about how good the land is. It's to want to be God's people in the land. It's a very different religious message, but I think it's an important one. Now, the last thing I want to show you is in, um, let, me, let me skip the file here. Let me stop this here for a second. Um, open up in the meantime, open up Perak, um, I'm sorry, open up Perak Tet back in Sefer Dvarim again. I just have it in my Chumash nice and, where do we have it here? We have, um, not that one, 40 days, I get it, that's it. There we go. Um, is it this one or this one? It's either this one or this one. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. We have. Oh, I'm sorry. Again, I didn't. I didn't share my screen again. If you look in share screen, if you look in Sefer Devarim, which one do we want here? Uh, we don't want that. Ben Ezra here. In Sefer Devarim, we have like this. Remember, we saw these two came that you know. God's bringing to a land, and you know, he scares them how, how, how muddy the enemy is, and you have to keep God's laws to get the land, and you don't deserve the land God's giving you because he promised your forefathers and everything. He's got, Moshe says as follows, from the time you left Egypt in Pasuk Zion, remember how bad you were, how much you got God to anger at you from the time you left Egypt. From the time you left Egypt. Notice, you've been rebellious against God. He tells the story of Chet Egel. And then continues the story of Beth Hegel and ends with Chav Gimel. And when God sent from Kadesh Barnea to go and, and go spout out the land, again, you rebelled against God and you didn't support him and you didn't obey him. Summarizing, 
You've been rebellious since the time I know you. Now, in the middle of the story of the spies, of, of the Chet Egel, he talks that he prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. He just said he prayed, but he didn't say what the prayer was. When he finishes the Musr, he goes and explains what his prayer was. And Moshe, again, in the 40th year, says, back then after Chet Egel, I prayed for 40 days and 40 nights because God wanted to destroy you. And what did I pray for? Two things. Remember your brief with our forefathers. Remember Brit Avot. And remember what might the nation say? Can you mark what, what, what might Egypt say? That maybe God doesn't have the strength to help us and therefore save us. And God listened to that prayer. In other words, Moshe is giving, telling his prayer. Now, pay attention to this. Rush, let me explain you something. Rashbam is bothered without going to the details. It's too complicated to share for now. But Rashbam is bothered by the fact that Moshe is telling the story of the sin of the, of Cheta Ego. He mentions in the story part about how rebellious you were, that he prayed. And when he finishes all the Musr, then he, like he said, footnote, he says, oh, by the way, this was my prayer. And he asks, why isn't the prayer altogether? Why does Moshe record what he prayed in the story? How come he's saving it for the footnote? So Rashbam is going to say, it's not a footnote, it's Moshe Rabbeinu's key point. And Rashbam is going to say something, you won't believe he's going to say this, but we're going to read it together. Um, I'm sorry, I share my screen. The Rashbam is on Pasek Chaf, in Perek Tet, in Pasek Chaf, um, in Perek Tet, in, in Perek Tet, I'm sorry, Pasek Chaf Dalet, Chaf Hei. Um, I'll, just, I'll just read, we'll, um, I'll read it with you, it's real easy. He says like this, Mi Aisha Chacham, Yasim Lev, whoever is wise, when they're reading Parsha Bet Hanan, chapter 9, even though it's summer vacation, pay attention, why was it necessary for Moshe to repeat his prayer after it was over, after he told the story. He said, does it make sense for Chumash just to repeat itself all the time? He says what he should have done. I'll just skip that part, we'll save time. He says like this, Ephes, right? He says, no, it's not, it's not, it's not poor composition that Moshe is doing. There's great wisdom in Moshe's speech. It's, what he's saying is, the fact that Moshe, after he gives the Musar, goes back and tells the detail of what his prayer was in the desert, there's great there's a great message here. There's great wisdom. Let me explain what the response is about to say because you won't believe what he's going to say. He says, why is Moshe detailing how he prayed in the desert? Remember, there was two points of his prayer. One was, remember your promise to the forefathers of the land and remember what the Egyptians might say. He says, he says like this, Moshe is warning the people, when you come to now that it's a new generation, in Sefer Tvarim, Moshe is worried that the people are going to be overconfident in the prayers of their leadership. They're going to think they can be a lousy people, but the rabbis will pray for them and everything will be fine, no matter how bad you are. What would they think? Moshe is afraid that the story of Chet Egel is going to be misleading, it will be almost dangerous. It seems like this. The people will say, when we sin, the terrible sin, like the sin of the golden calf, we served other gods, and Moshe David and saved us from destruction. You see what he's saying? Moshe is worried that the people might think, when they study Chumash, they'll think that prayer can save them no matter what. And because they know they can always pray, they can always pray to God, or the leaders can pray to God, and it'll save them from punishment, they'll become lax in their, in their behavior. You follow that? Moshe is worried about the danger of prayer. Because the second you believe in prayer that I can pray that God will help me, it'll lead people not to keep the laws carefully. Again, and the people will say, when we come and conquer the land of Israel, whenever we're in trouble, oh, we can pray and God will save us. Amar lahem, Moshe, what's Moshe tell them? Listen carefully. Can you believe what he's saying this? Moshe is saying, Prayer worked in the desert because there was logic behind it. But once you conquer the land of Israel, Tfilot are not going to help again. He says now, Kiatai is now in the desert. The reason why God forgave you in the desert was because of the Chilo Hashem, because what the Egyptians might say. Or because they might say that God couldn't help you defeat them or because God didn't keep his promise to their forefathers. Because what did I daven then? Remember your promise to our forefathers. 
And what, what would the nation say? That God wasn't able to fulfill his promise. Right? right? And that's why the reason why God answered my prayer in the desert was because it was logic, because there'll be a chilo Hashem if God killed you in the desert. Listen, listen what he says now. Aval, lachar shi'arek shloshim v'chad balachim. After our first wave of conquest of Israel, once we finished the first half of Sefer Yoshua and we killed the, the, we conquered the land and killed the 31 kings, we had Chilchem et Aretz and God gives us the land, no longer can people say that God didn't keep his promise. Okay? Okay? Then what will happen? If you sin after God brings you into the land, az yotziachem v'garash etchem in Aretz. If you sin after God fulfills his promise of King Saul Aretz, then if you sin, he'll have to throw you out. Why? If God punishes us after he fulfilled his first promise of conquering the land, after the time of Yeshua, if we sin and God punishes us, the people won't say God's punished us because he's a lousy God, but rather, the people will say, why is God punishing them? Because they didn't keep God's mitzvah. And he explains, like he's, God Moshe explains in Parshat Nitzavim, when God will bring the tochacha of Sefer Dvarim, remember in Parshat Nitzavim, when the, the, when the Goyim will ask, why is God so angry at his people? What should calamity happen? Should God punish his people after we enter the land of Israel? The Goyim won't say God didn't keep his promise to our forefathers because he kept that promise. What would they say instead? I'm so being punished because of sin. And God will be sanctified by how he punishes us when we openly don't follow God. It's, it's a really harsh rush bomb. I just didn't, I, I saw it two weeks ago when I was doing, um, I forgot how I got into it. I was preparing a share and I just stumbled into this. I couldn't believe what I was reading. But you see that rush bomb? But the rush bomb is the same idea that God's giving us the land of Israel in order to be his people, to keep his laws. And we need to know, he's saying there's a danger in prayer. That prayer, the fact that I know that God answers prayer, might cause people to be lax and they're keeping the mitzvot. So Moshe is telling the people, I prayed for you in the desert, with what reason? Remember Brit Avot, and remember it might be Echel Hashem. He says, that only worked in the desert. When you come to Israel, that's not going to work. If you don't keep his mitzvot, boy, you're in trouble. If you read Sefer Dvarim carefully, Moshe just continues that theme left and right. You better keep his laws. If you don't, if we say that every day in Shema, it's all Midat Adin. If you follow, I'll bless you. Don't follow, you're in big trouble. Because the whole theme of Devarim is, is we're setting a high standard that I want you to be my people, I give you land to serve me properly. If you don't, I'll have to punish you. So again, it's an important um, rush bomb to at least be aware of and be careful of that knowing that God can forgive shouldn't cause people to be lax in their, in their behavior. Knowing, I, oh, I can always pray and get out of it. Like, you know, mommy, my grand, grandfather can always get me out of jail. Kind of idea, no matter how bad I am. Because knowing that you have protexia sometimes can cause lead to bad behavior. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't pray when things are bad, but the prayer has to make sense. And therefore, if God is threatening punishment, you have to daven and do real tshuva and not just say, oh, it'll be a chilo Hashem. Anyway, so that was, um, started to leave on such a sad note. But I wanted to just do, so we learned chetam raglim. And we see it both in Bamidbar and Devarim. Again, why the, why the story is different in Devarim, that's a different topic of that has to do with the purpose of Moshe's speech in Sefer Dvarim. But in Dvarim, Moshe Rabbeinu was giving a pep talk to get the people to be inspired to keep his laws properly. And there was going to be really harsh and set a really high standard. I'll, I'll give one last example of what, what, what Rosh Pam is getting at. If you're a teacher or a professor at, in a college class, whatever it is, in the beginning of the year, when the students begin, you're going to tell them attendance is mandatory. You miss one class, you know, you're going to fail. If you don't give in your papers, you're going to fail, you follow, you're going to be really strict about the demands of this course. Now, in reality, you can miss half the classes, you cannot give in two assignments, you follow, and you'll pass the course anyhow. But you don't tell the people in the beginning of the year that you can miss half your classes, and you don't have to do it, and don't take it seriously. It might be, the, the teacher might be a forgiving teacher later on, but you don't tell that in the beginning. And therefore, when Moshe is giving his goodbye speech, and getting the new generation ready, he's going to set the standards really, really high, be very demanding. In reality, God's going to be forgiving. But you don't start your education with, don't worry, God will forgive you no matter how bad you are. You start with, God's a strict God. That's why we have the first luchot and the second luchot. 
The first of all, they're very demanding. The second one comes with Midot Rachamim. If I begin with Midot Rachamim, people take advantage of it. But if I, I begin with the way things should be, and then when things mess up, then we have what to daven for. But you don't begin with the, with the assumption is, oh, if I mess up, everything will be fine anyhow. All I need to do is daven or do something magical. And therefore, Moshe is giving a very harsh, but hopefully inspirational sicha uh, in Sefer Devarim. And that's why he's going to sort of present the event of Marglim in a very harsh manner, putting most of the blame on the people. But again, I want to just review my key points, is that the sin of the spies is a, it's, a, it's a question of leadership. And God's goal is not the people wanting, wanting to be Zionistic or wanting to be in the land of Israel. It's not believing that God exists or that God can do miracles. They know God can do miracles and that God exists. The question, do they support God? Do they want to be his people? And bottom line, there's no, Am Yisrael can't go into the land until they're ready to be God's people. And that's why that generation has to wait. That's why we have to bring another generation. It's not a singular event. Oh, one sin, and that's the punishment. It's a, that's what he says, it's a culmination of all the events that say that Egypt. This first generation has an attitude problem. It's not getting any better. It's not working. The last chance to make it work God was hoping if Moshe can't get them to be inspired, maybe the natural leadership will get them inspired. And he sends them, hopefully if they're involved, maybe they'll come up with a good inspirational report. And that also fails. And that's why God's so upset. We have to wait for to bring up a whole new generation. Uh, was it bound to fail? That's what some people say. There was no way the first generation would ever make it because they were head slave mentality. But that's already looking back at history. Uh, it's called being a Monday morning quarterback. If you remember the saying or... Uh, or hind, what's it, 2020 hind vision, or something like that. But you, you can understand why it didn't work because of the background. But the question, what did we learn from the story in Chumash? So we learned that, that it's not just believing that God you know, exists or that God gave us the land. It's knowing our responsibility of our, our need to want to, to, to want to serve God, want to keep his means full. That's the reason why God will give us. Anyway, so again, I hope that message wasn't too harsh on everybody. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're thank you. <laughs> Don't worry, we're still Zionistic, but uh, but, uh, but it comes you... with responsibility. Can you... Great, Rabbi. It's so good to see okay, you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Stay safe. I hope you understand my analogies about keeping rules and if you believe in them and support them. That was good. That's why it's good doing these things in Zoom. It's a lot safer than being in a crowded shul. But we have no bagels and locks today, huh? Everyone's uh, supposed to bring on, I'm waiting uh, for that to be virtual. Okay, we have to, no, you can. Everyone can buy them, bring on their own. <laughs> Menachem, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. I can stand and answer okay. questions. I got nothing to do. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to comment. I mean, basically, I have had this same reading of the Miraglim for many, many years. That, uh, and I just wanted to explain what I meant by fake news. The Miraglim told the truth, as you said. They mm -hmm. came in with holding the fruit to great fanfare. The people were around them. But event, but next Pesach says, Fayom Rulo. In other words, they, who did they tell? They told Moshe. They brought it. They went into the Oval Office, had a private meeting with Moshe and Aharon. Suddenly, the next Pesach is Vayahaz Kalev. What, what happened? They're, they're in the Oval Office discussing, and suddenly the people are going crazy because there was a leak. The leak, the left wing media got a hold of the story. They spinned it. They created the fake news. And that got all the people and turned public opinion against the spies and motion. And so once the spies said, you know, public opinion is against us, okay, maybe low new how. So that seems to me to be a clear rendering just from those Tsukim, which is very similar to I think what you were saying. Okay, good. With a contemporary, you know, he's saying, he's saying fake news. True, true. But that's what happens with the left-wing media. They'll they'll destroy everything. So uh, that's what happened. And that's what they say about the right-wing media. <laughs> Not true. The right-wing media just tells the facts. People can, you know, decide. The left-wing media, you know, spins it, and uh, and 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 you end up with uh, everybody dying, which is why the hate of the people not. The people having no confidence, there was no kapara for that. They all died. Whereas the Chet Egel, there was kapara because that was merely Brit Sinai. Yeah. Brit Avot, the land of Israel, if you deny it, if you're Mavaze, there's no kapara. Okay. okay. My end of my soapbox. Okay, that's the Mizrahi uh, 
It's a yeah. Mizrahi program. Absolutely, so we got absolutely, absolutely. Well, it goes back to the Rub and the Ramban and all of that. So yeah, the whole stuff. Resources for it. Okay, fine. All okay, right. Good week and a good Shabbos. And um, there's a lot more things I wanted to cover, but we'll do them another time. Yeah. Okay. Look That's forward it. to it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Rav Menachem, we're ending, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. אני לא רואה את התמונה, רגע. אה, שנייה, 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 אני אפתח את זה, בסדר גמור. אה, אתה נתן, כן. מהיכן אתה נתן? אני נתן. כן, אז אנחנו סוגרים את האירוע, אנשים כבר בורחים, אוקיי. בסדר, אין בעיה, בסדר. בסדר, מאה אחוז, מאה אחוז.